Hello everybody, my name is Yuri and I'm glad to welcome you to the lecture number four in my introductory course on data science. Today we'll learn about sensitivity, specificity, confusion metrics and rock curves. I'll try to make it as intuitive as possible but we'll build on previous lectures so if you are here for the first time I highly recommend you to have a look at at least one lecture, Logistic Regression. We'll start with the repetition of the second lecture. As always, we take a small, simple example of data with only two columns, and imagine we want to know the influence of one column on the other column. The trick is always to plot the data. And if we plot the data, we already may see some trend. And if we see some trend, we can fit a linear regression to it, and even the simplest linear regression is already a machine learning model. It is machine learning because our model learned from the data and became a bit smarter. So we can ask questions about the areas of the plot where we do not have data for. So we simply can make predictions. But what about zeros and ones? For example, if we want to know the probability of sickness, we can use logistic regression to learn from the data. Logistic regression is also a machine learning model. And the only two things which remain to figure out is how do we predict zeros and ones and how do we check the quality of such predictions? Well, in this lecture, we answer these questions and through answering these questions, we will learn about this new concept I already prognosed, sensitivity, specificity, confusion matrix, and rock curves. The first time I saw the fitted values of the logistic regression, I didn't know what to do with this. And simply by drawing one line, which splits this plot into two halves, helped me already. Because using the threshold of 0.5, and we can classify the predicted probabilities into ones and zeros. So the probabilities which are above this threshold will become one, and the probabilities which are below this threshold uh, will become zero. Having this threshold help us to answer the first question, how do we predict zeros and ones? Namely, we use the probabilities and classify them into two different classes ones and zeros. And this idea of classification uh, was heavily adapted by the machine learning and artificial intelligence communities. And you will hear about classification models a lot. So now, having this simple example of logistic regression, you already know how classification models work. Now, using machine learning approach, we can answer our second question about how do we check quality of our predictions. For this, we use this algorithm of only five steps. And for the first step, we just imagine 100 people we want to study. And we split this data, about 100 people, into two data sets, training and testing uh, data sets. Into training data sets, we take randomly 80 of our people. And remaining 20 people will be put into testing data set. In the second step, we train our model. It sounds really fancy, but it's actually not. All we do here, we use our training data set with only 80% of our data and fit the usual logistic regression. In the next step, which calls test the model, we use only age from test data to get probabilities for sickness. So we ask this trained model without showing it this, the probability of sickness, which we already know, what do you think about our new data? And then by fitting the test model, we classify our probabilities into zeros and ones. And in the last step, we simply compare the known test sickness from these 20 people and the predicted sickness from our model. Let's have a simple example to repeat this process and understand it more properly. So imagine our model is trained. Then we hide the sickness data, real data from our testing data set we already know from this model and put only age data into this trained model. What the model will do is it will predict the probability of getting sick 
um, based on this age data. What we do next is we classify these probabilities into zeros and ones. The probabilities below 0 0.5 will become zero, and the probabilities above 0 0.5 will become one. But since we knew everything about these 20 people, which are in the test data set, we can compare the real data to the predicted data. And that's exactly how we check the quality of predictions. And if you look at this, um, we only have two possibilities here, zeros and ones, and two predicted possibilities, zeros and ones. So you can imagine we have four possible outcomes. In the first outcome, if the person was sick or positive on the sickness, and the model predicted it to be positive, then we have a true positive outcome. Secondly, if the person was healthy or negative on this sickness, and the model predicted it correctly, then we have a true negative outcome. However, if the person was healthy or negative on the sickness, but the model falsely predicted this person to be sick or to be positive, then we have a false positive result. You see, the model predicted positive result, but it is false. That's why it calls false positive. And the last possibility of this outcome is that the person is sick, but our model failed to predict the sickness. So it's also false negative result because our model predicted this person to be negative on the sickness. So you see that some predictions were correct, uh, like in this green color, and some other predictions got confused. And the word confused is the key word here because we can put all these four possible outcomes in the matrix to have a summary of our data set or summary of our predictions. And since some prediction got confused, this matrix is called confusion matrix. Again, this kind of summary will allow us to evaluate the quality of our predictions. And only four numbers are important here. You can ignore the totals for a moment. Four is our number of uh, true positive results. Three is our number of true negative results. Two is our number of false positive results. And the last one is false negative result. So despite the fact that confusion matrix has become really famous and really fancy due to the advance in machine learning, it was already known before. And to tell you why, we just have to make one link between the machine learning and epidemiology. Imagine a medical institution which tested a lot of people on some kind of sickness. And if several doctors and several analyzers, several parameters revealed whether the person was sick or not sick, we can check one or second test on its quality because we already know the state of the sickness. So we apply a new test um, if it is cheap and easy to apply to these people and see whether the results of the test are correct or not correct. Again, in the medical field or in epidemiology, you also have uh, four possible outcomes. The true positives and true negatives, if the test was correct, and false negative and false uh, positives, is the, if the test was not correct. So by having this uh, cross table, simple cross table in epidemiology, we have exactly the same output as the confusion matrix in machine learning based on the model predictions. And this is the good news for both parties, medical researchers and people in machine learning community. Because medical researchers already know a lot about machine learning by simply extracting information from this uh, confusion matrix, like sensitivity, specificity, prevalence of the sickness, and so on. And it's a good news for machine learning people because they can go to medical literature and have a lot of solid knowledge about it. These are our 10 predictions with it. And we see that the model sometimes correctly identified young people to be uh, healthy and all the people to be sick. But sometimes this model identified some older people to be sick despite the fact that they can be healthy or some younger people to be healthy, despite the fact that some young people also get sick. 
And using only these four numbers, we can start to calculate very useful metrics like sensitivity, specificity, or false positive rates, to name a few. And these metrics are useful for both medicine researchers and machine learning professionals. And particularly, the sensitivity is the percentage of healthy people which were correctly identified as healthy. Uh, specificity is the number of sick people which were correctly identified. And false positive rate is the percentage of healthy people which were incorrectly identified as sick. And sensitivity and false positive rate, these two are particularly useful because we can start to plot them on the plot to evaluate the quality of our model or the quality of our medical test. Let me repeat some important definitions here. Sensitivity is the percentage of sick people who are correctly identified as sick. Sensitivity is sometimes called true positive rate, recall, probability of detection, or power. And I personally hate the nomenclature because why would you talk about one thing and call it four different names? It first disturbs the communication be between professionals, and secondly, it heavily disturbs the learning process because it confuses you. Why would you learn four different things instead of one? Specificity is the percentage of healthy people who were correctly identified as healthy. Specificity also has uh, several names, for example, true negative rate or selectivity. Important definition is also false positive rate. It is the percentage of healthy people who were incorrectly identified as sick. False positive rate is the opposite of true negative rate or the opposite of specificity. It's sometimes called type 1 error or the probability of false alarm. Calling it in the machine learning lingo, it sometimes calls fall out. False negative rate is the percentage of sick people who are incorrectly identified as healthy. And sometimes it's called miss rate, if we call it in the machine learning lingo, or if we call it in a statistical way, it is called type 2 error. And here I have to emphasize that type 2 error is much worse than type 1 error, or false negative is much worse than false positive. To visualize this example, imagine the cancer test where you were erroneously diagnosed as positive. It is very scary, but after three consecutive tests, you were diagnosed as healthy. So this test was disproved. And despite the fact that it was very uh, scary, it is not fatal. So you can survive it. Then imagine the type 2 error. You first was erroneously diagnosed as a healthy person. And then you celebrate, you party, you're absolutely cancer-free. But after some time, let's imagine after one year, you start to feel really bad. And then you do three good consecutive tests, and all three consecutive tests show that you uh, have cancer, that you're positive on cancer. This is very scary and even fatal because through this year, the cancer may have progressed irreversibly. That's why it is very important to avoid uh, type 2 errors. The ideal test is, of course, both highly sensitive, where you reduce the type 2 error, and highly specific, where you reduce the type 1 error at the same time. However, it is often impossible in praxis. That's why you have to adjust the threshold, the probability threshold, in order to make either more high specific, highly specific test or highly sensitive test. For example, if our goal is not to miss any C cases, we need a highly sensitive test. It's often the first test we do. So we lower the threshold of probability and this increases our sensitivity and decreases the specificity. Sometimes it is absolutely essential to correctly classify all disease positive samples, for example, in our corona crisis, in order to stop this outbreak, even if this results in more false positive cases. And lowering the threshold will result in zero missed cases, which is good for, for stopping the outbreak, but it will also result in a lot of false positives, which will scare a lot of people. 
Anyway, as you can see, the confusion matrix changed a bit. So will the calculation of sensitivity, specificity, and false positive rates. And this, again, will give us another point on the plot, which shows that the first test you do in order to stop the outbreak is the test with high sensitivity and low specificity. You see, this is the opposite of specificity. But if your goal is not to scare any healthy person or save some resources, for example, you don't want healthy person to take medicaments, which are rare and important, to spend some money or take some other limited resources out of the system, you have to increase the probability threshold and make a highly specific test. This test is often made second after the outbreak has stopped. And of course, it also changes the confusion matrix. It gives you zero false positive cases and unfortunately a lot of false negative. But uh, if we continue to calculate our sensitivity and specificity and false positive rate and plot this, we will start to see some kind of trend. So imagine we change the probability threshold not three times, but a lot of times. And every time we will get new confusion matrix, which is a summary of our predictions or a medical test. And every time we would get another point on this curve. So if we connect the dots, we get our curve, which is actually called a rock curve, receiver operating characteristics. You don't have to understand what this name means. You don't have to even have a definition about it. But now you know how it is created from really basic idea of looking at the data, making a model, making predictions, changing the thresholds, and evaluating these predictions for every possible threshold. And summarizing these all possible thresholds in the one plot or rock curve. So, as you can see, the rock curve is not that fancy. If we check all the probability thresholds, we will create this rock curve. And I already did this for you. One of the most important characteristics of this curve is the area under this curve. And starting from approximately 80%, your medical test or your model predictions are really good or are considered to be really good. So our logistic regression with the error under the curve of 92% did a pretty good job. The second important point on this curve is the highest point on this curve. And if you look at this curve, this will be our highest point. It calls it optimal cutoff. And despite the new name again, it's a really familiar concept to you. Optimal cutoff is simply the probability threshold which allows you to get maximum sensitivity and maximum specificity at the same time. And if you remember, I told you that we want a highly specific and highly sensitive test at the same time, and there is a trade-off. So that's why we have to look for the optimal combination of these both metrics. As you have seen, a logistic regression is a useful classification model. And of course, there are other classification models out there. One of the most famous is the random forest algorithm. And here in this plot, I applied random forest algorithms to our data. So I changed the probability thresholds, made different predictions, produced different confusion matrices, and summarized all the confusion matrices in this rock curve. We see that random forest algorithm gives us lower area under the curve than logistic regression. And this is one of the most useful features of the raw curves. It allows you to compare several models. Or, as a medical professional, it allows you to compare the results of several tests or quality of several tests and choose the best by choosing the higher area under the curve. And despite the fact that uh, the error under the curve of random forest here in our example is so low, this model is not really worse in general. 
And if we grow the number of observations, the result of logistic regression will get worse. Unfortunately, results of random forest algorithm will get better because algorithm will learn a lot from the numbers. And this ability to improve the quality of predictions with the increasing amount of data is the essence of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And the more data we give to our models, the better prediction we will get out of them. So until now we talked about numbers, but we can also use pictures for machine learning models. Um, if we consider a picture being a bunch of different numbers, for example, pixels, we can simply put them into the model. And if we train the model with pictures of dogs and cats, and then ask the model about the new data or a new picture, it will classify this picture into the cat or a dog. And the more pictures the model see, the better the predictions will be. And there is a threshold of around 10,000 pictures where the model can get better than a human being. Imagine a medical example. For example, we have a tissues of cancer and 10,000 pictures, classified pictures of tissue of cancer. And a doctor needs to see all these 10,000 pictures. It needs to know why it is cancer or not cancer, and it need to remember all these pictures. This is called the experience of a doctor, and the older the doctor gets, the usually better the doctor becomes. However, you need years of experience, and the more data you give to the doctor, the more doctor will forget because we cannot simply remember everything as human beings. However, the model will only improve, and 10,000 pictures threshold is is already proven to be often better than human beings. Okay, now we have numbers, we covered pictures. What about video? What if we make a video from a bunch of cameras and give it to the model? Well, if we consider a video being a consecutive number of pictures, we also can analyze videos. And if the model can learn from these videos what is good behavior and what is not good behavior, for example, imagine the uh, self-driving car. And if the model learns from a lot of accidents what not to do, the self-driving car will avoid the situations where it can get into the accidents or will try to decrease the probability to go into these situations which potentially can lead to the um, accident. So you see, um, even the simple logistic regression which we use today is not far away from the machine learning um, area. So let's summarize everything we learned so far. The goal of the logistic regression or any other classifier is the same as the goal of a medical test to classify. Lowering probability threshold leads to more sensitive tests and so to less missed cases. Increasing the probability threshold leads to more specific tests and so to less scared cases. Different thresholds produce different sensitivities and specificities. Of course, it will produce different confusion, uh, confusion matrices and they will be summarized in the form of the rock curve. That's why the raw curve is literally confusing. We want a test or a classifier that is both highly sensitive and highly specific. And this is unfortunately often impossible uh, because there is a trade-off. An area under the curve shows the best cutoff for classification, which shows the best combination between sensitivity and specificity. And area under the curve shows the quality of the classifier or a medical test. Interestingly, only four numbers of a confusion matrix can produce a confusingly high number of useful metrics. Here is a small example, which you can find on Wikipedia in the article on sensitivity and specificity. And I personally could extract 25 uh, different metrics out of these four numbers um, without even taking area under the curve into consideration. So there are at least 26 useful metrics. Here are example, uh, examples of a couple of those. 
And, and the first thing um, I have to say about this, that some of the metrics are more famous in the medical world, for example, prevalence or coins kappa, and some other metrics are more famous in the machine learning world, like accuracy, maybe detection rate, and Matthew's correlation coefficient. But they all stem from the confusion matrix. Another interesting thing is uh, that you don't need to have a high level of mathematical knowledge in order to calculate them. They are all pretty easy calculations. But despite the fact that they are all easily calculated by the hand, you will never do this. You just simply ask computers to do this. So just make sure that your confusion matrix is correct and confirm it with a few of the metrics calculated manually, and you will get the output of everything you can handle and even more, like sensitivity and specificity, positive predicted values, and so on. Here's an example of another package which is more specialized on the uh, machine learning. It's a carrot package in R, statistical language, produced by, by Max Kuhn. And it also gives a lot of metrics. So the big take home message is that you should use statistical software because it will give you more answers than you can handle. And if you need more information about this lecture or about three lectures before, you can click on these links. What I also would recommend is to go to the George Starmer's videos because he is an amazing statistician who can explain really intuitively. So, thank you very much for learning and hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.